The Venom film is finally out, and regardless of whether or not you think it did the iconic character justice, fans of the comics are all wondering about what little easter eggs and references were hidden in the movie. As with any comic book adaptation, you can bet your butt that there's a whole lot of references tucked in there. So today we're counting them down with the top 10 easter eggs you missed in Venom. And also references. We also won't be mentioning any of the Easter eggs that we previously discussed on our list that broke down the film's trailer. So if you're curious, be sure to check that out afterwards too. So with that in mind, let's jump in, guys. And at number 10, Carnage. Let's start off our list with the most obvious Easter egg of them all. The movie has two post credit scenes, one of which was just an advertisement trailer for the upcoming Spider Man Into the Spider Verse animated film. But the other, the first mid credit scene, featured Woody Harrelson playing the role we all assumed he would be playing. Cletus Cassidy. Cletus is being interviewed by Eddie Brock, and he tells him that when he gets out of prison, which he swears he will, there will be Carnage. Clearly this is a reference to the fact that Cassidy becomes the host of the Carnage symbiote. Now in the comics, Eddie at one point is incarcerated, and ends up sharing his prison cell with Cassidy, a deranged serial killer. When Venom, who Eddie believes was no longer with him, turns out to be dormant and re-emerges, Eddie rebonds with him and breaks out of prison. But Venom does something that Eddie isn't aware of. He drops off one of his seeds, which is how the Clintar procreate. The seed ends up becoming a full symbiote and bonds with Cassidy after Eddie is gone, and this is later revealed to Brock when Carnage goes on a killing spree, all of which makes him Venom's arch nemesis. We actually did a whole video on our channel explaining what this post credit scene means and how it may impact the sequel, so definitely check that out after this video. Also a side note, Cassidy writes in his own blood on his prison wall, Welcome Eddie, which is a nice touch, considering Carnage in the comics would always write in blood at the crime scenes of his victims during his killing spree after Cassidy broke out of prison. Moving on to number 9, a finer detail in the form of a bench press. In the comics, Eddie is a bit of a muscle head, and often when we're in his apartment, you can see that he has weights and a bench press there. This is a nice detail that was added into the film too. You can note in the background of various shots that it's been included in the set deck of Eddie's apartment. And at number 8, Ultimate Universe. Many fans had questions about how Venom's origin story would play out in this film, considering that Sony wasn't allowed to use the Spider-Man origin that Venom is derived from. Now in the comics, Venom technically first appears in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 252 from 1984, in which he's a black symbiote alien costume that Spider-Man puts on after his uniform was trashed. Later, with the help of the Fantastic Four, the costume is removed from Parker. Venom would then return to bond with Eddie Brock in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 299 in 1988, who had a pickle to pick with Peter Parker. Anywho, the origin story in this movie matches up a bit with Venom's origin in a different part of the Marvel comics, the Ultimates universe. Venom in that universe wasn't an alien organism, but rather was a man-made attempt to cure cancer that then turned into complete chaos. This is the same thing that the Life Foundation claims that it's doing too to cure cancer. Moving on to number 7, Kryptonite. During a conversation between Anne and Eddie, Anne mentions that Sonics are Venom's kryptonite. Whoa. So that means that Superman, in some capacity, likely as a comic book character or a pop culture icon, exists within this Sony Marvel universe. 100% a fictional character though. Make what you will of that, guys. And at number 6, Mr. Belvedere. Anne has a cat in the movie, and his name is Mr. Belvedere. This is actually a reference to a character named Lynn Belvedere, who was the protagonist of the novel Belvedere. The book and character were adapted into a handful of movies in the 40s and 50s, and a sitcom in the 80s. Mr. Belvedere was a butler who worked for an American family and hilarity ensued. Also fun fact, the actor who played the lead role, Christopher Hewitt, once sat down on his balls so hard that they had to stall production because of it. Luckily I don't think Anne's cat will ever have that problem. Mr. Belvedere has also made many other appearances as a reference in the likes of Futurama and Family Guy. Up next at 5, Ron Lim Herbal. If you look closely during the final scene of the movie, you may spot a sign that reads Ron Lim Herbal on one of the shops in the background. This is actually a shout out to one of the artists who worked on a Venom storyline in the comics, the 1993 Venom Lethal Protector which is where a lot of the symbiote characters were pulled from for this movie, including Riot. Riot along with those other symbiotes wouldn't be given a name until Carnage USA issue 2, when it was bonded with Howard Ogden. And that was because of a fan name it was given thanks to its official toy line installment. The toy was named Riot, and it stuck. Anywho, Ron Lim has also worked on a ton of other Marvel properties, including Volume 3 of Silver Surfer and the famous Infinity Gauntlet with Jim Starlin, uh, the comic that largely inspired the movie Avengers Infinity War. And at number 4, Dog Host. In the mid-2000s Venom run, Venom possessed a dog when trying to escape captivity in the Arctic. This is something that the movie borrowed as well, having Venom also possess a dog to escape from captivity of the Life Foundation. It's also worth noting that the comic may have been inspired by John Carpenter's The Thing in that sense, which begins with the wolf escaping and running onto the character's 
Andrew's facility after it was possessed by the thing. Side note, that's not the only time that symbiotes have proven to bond with animals, specifically dogs. During the Deadpool vs Carnage series, Hybrid, which is an amalgamation of many of the symbiotes you got a glimpse of in the movie, including Riot, bonded with a dog that Deadpool let run free by the end of the series. And also, you know, made his friend. And at number 3, Stan Lee. Of course there's a Stan Lee cameo in this movie. It's tradition, really. Regardless of whether it's an MCU film, a Fox film, or a Sony one. Stan's cameo this time has him walking a dog, pausing to give Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock some advice on his relationship with Michelle Williams and Wang, after he gets a glimpse of the couple in public. Good old Stan. And Venom's reaction to Stan? Who's that guy? Something that definitely got a lot of laughs in theaters. Moving on to number two, She Venom. In the comics, Eddie Brock's significant other Anne Wang bonds with the Venom symbiote to become She Venom. Now, at the time, she's his ex wife and ends up getting caught in a battle between Venom and Spider-Man. She's injured, and the symbiote transfers to her in order to heal her from a gunshot wound. And it happens in the film, but under different circumstances. When Eddie is separated from Venom thanks to an MRI machine, Venom bonds with Anne in an attempt to stop the Life Foundation from murdering him. There's even a moment where she kisses Eddie in a very gross, sloppy way in order to transfer Venom back to Brock. According to director Ruben Fleischer, she Venom may potentially appear again in later Venom movies, saying that she would be, I quote, fun to explore within the body of a Venom movie. And and then there's also the possibility of, who knows, a She Venom standalone movie. Later on in the comics, the second time Anne bonds with Venom, she ends up committing suicide afterwards because of the trauma of bonding with the symbiote and seeing and feeling everything Venom had experienced drives her over the edge. And finally, in at number one, John Jameson. This one is pretty cool. So in the comics, J. Jonah Jameson, the publisher of the Daily Bugle, has a son named John who first appeared in the Amazing Spider Man issue one in 1963. He's an astronaut, but would later on become Man Wolf years later, removing himself from just being the newspaper tyrant's kid. While there's some details in the movie that remove it from the MCU universe, like the Daily Bugle's name being changed to the Daily Globe, John Jameson is still an astronaut, mentioned as one of the astronauts killed when the Life Foundation space shuttle crash landed back on the planet. Now, According to director Ruben Fleischer, it is in fact John Jameson's character from the comics, saying, I quote, We tried to weave in little things here and there that just felt like an easy fan acknowledgement. Like if you're going to have an astronaut, he should be J. Jonah Jameson the third. Alright, there we have it friends. What are your thoughts on the Venom movie? Are you excited for a sequel that will feature Carnage? As I mentioned before, we have a video that we released yesterday that breaks down exactly what the post credit scene implies for Venom's future. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and head on over there to check it out. If you dug this video, spread the love, hit that like button, and be sure to take a look at the playlist currently flashing on your screen to see more videos about Venom and your other favorite Marvel characters. In the meantime though, thanks for watching everybody, I'll catch you all in the next video.